थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग आकांक्षा सो यू आर अ वाइल्ड लाइफ फिल्म मेकर वॉट आई वॉन्ट टू नो एंड वी वर डिस्कसिंग अ लिटल बिट अबाउट इट बिफोर विच एनिमल इज द बिगेस्ट एस होल्ड टू शूट लाइक विच गिव्स यू द मोस्ट ट्रबल a lot of them do actually all of them do they never come on time they don't come when you want them to come yeah. at a particular place sometimes they make you wait for hours sometimes the hair is not done hair you know nails are not done there's spit drooling and yeah. there's too much of blood exactly. it gets very gory yeah yeah there are a lot of issues every animal has mm-hmm. its uh, set of uh, problems but yeah. um they're fun to film. Mm-hmm. I think they're much better than humans. I worked in fiction before and yeah. I can tell you I'd rather be out in the wild waiting for an animal to turn up. I could sit there for 7 days and wait right. than have to wait for a human being to turn up <laughs> to, at a particular, you know, yeah. time for a particular shot. You were telling me about this uh, tigress you got very close, right? Yes. And she was almost like giving you the That look. was a lioness. That was a lioness. Yes. Oh, okay. And she was like about to mate or something and you uh, she was were... in heat and mm-hmm. uh, we were doing this particular film uh, on on um, the lions in gujarat it's called india's wandering lions mm-hmm. it's the first film shot in india completely at night oh yeah wildlife you know we traditionally made to think that the sun comes up and the animals yeah. wake up and yeah. they pass their day they hunt they do yeah. whatever and the sun goes down and every i think it it's all over yeah. you know everyone's gone to sleep but yeah. no in the wild a lot of action happens at night and we want right. to break, basically show that what happens at night and lions were a great subject uh, mm-hmm. because they are very active at night and mm-hmm. they hunt and it's a pride that moves around and mm-hmm. it's very unique in gujarat because there's a large population of lions that lives outside the protected area in human habitation oh okay yeah and uh, this one particular time we we kind of were following this female who was on heat mm-hmm. and um, our vehicle stopped about 8 feet away from her and we didn't realize but we'd come between her and her mate mm. and um, we were we were at eye level you know the cameras are at eye level so you're very low on the jeep okay. and she looked straight at me in the eye i was a thermal camera operator wow. and it was dusk mm-hmm. and i was scared yeah really really scared i have spent 20 years now filming big cats and tigers right. especially right. that one line is really shook me with that look she yeah. gave me she wanted to get laid she can't did come, <laughs> can't come in between that right <laughs> cannot stop a line from getting laid you can't you what can't. did you do nothing we just backed our jeep and moved out of there the best yeah. thing to do yeah. probably but then we got a good shot of you know the male and the female coming together and then going off <laughs> oh so the so you did not record the action we have a lot of uh, recorded a lot of such action but right. yeah but you know i mean you have to know when you can film and not film you have What to you kind of you can't just follow an animal endlessly it gets irritated it gets yeah. you know it gets disturbed mm-hmm. there are some times you just have to switch off and let mm. nature do whatever it is doing so how do you decide like uh uh you you've just said you have a lot of shots of animals mating but also you want to like leave them uh, you know doing whatever they want to do so how do you decide what call do you need to take do you want to film them um, or leave them okay so you know um once you get a particular sequence mm-hmm. you don't want the same sequence again and again and again unless your t- your film is on how animals mate and have babies yeah, exclusively. you know exclusively you will want a lot of mating shots sure. but um, other than that you know it's it's very different every story is very different every sequence mm. that you get is very unique and once you've got it you can't keep harping on it in a film you want yeah, to show something yeah. different and there's a lot to show it's yeah. not just about mating it's about how they you know fend for themselves how they mm. live how they eat what they eat what mm. they do um, so yeah it, it, Mm. there's a, there's a story and you know what sequences yeah. you want what you get what you get you get sometimes mm. you get a lot more sometimes you don't get anything at all yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. it's it's very difficult filming in the so, wild so how do you so how does a, a film production decide like uh, because for fiction we have the script we have the actors and everyone's following instructions right but you can't do that with animals and we've seen like attenborough and all the bbc doing it for years and years and years but when you are on a target right obviously there must be a timeline to finishing the production so uh, uh, who decides like uh, uh it's very character and story driven mm-hmm. um you know uh the, like in fiction there's a script that you follow a script mm-hmm. there are shows in wildlife that are scripted 
there's okay. a very uh, uh, popular series called monkey thieves right on national geographic yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a scripted show okay so they've actually scripted it out and then shot it and oh. put it together according to that script it's factually correct mm-hmm. okay but it's just a lot more drama and of entertainment course. and people connect with it and you know mm-hmm. you you understand much better in fact i'm working on a similar uh, script right now mm-hmm. um yeah and a lot of obviously uh, wildlife is is um, you know character and story based so you know that you want to make a film on a particular animal and you decide whether it's a year long or a two year long or a five year long process of mm. filming depends mm. on your story what are you trying to show right you know uh, very recently i saw a film called uh, ghost of the arctic it's on the arctic wolves right it's filmed over a very short season of i think of two months mm mm-hmm. mm It's a beautiful film the kind of access and the kind of footage and the sequences right. and the action and the drama that cinematographer has been able to capture mm-hmm. it's just about you know this female who already has a pup mm-hmm. and she she's threatened by um, other uh, wolves around she has to move her pup from this particular den to the next den mm. that shot little thing has been made into a beautiful one hour film wow and it's amazing the kind of you know things that you get to see i mean i i i would have never thought yeah you know that uh, i could get access to something like that so it's it's Are you a part of that no 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 okay. no, no no it's 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 a, it's a foreign production i think right. a german production mm-hmm. but yeah. yeah you have equally good wildlife here in india and you know you can make some great stories and compete mm-hmm. with the bbc's and national geographic's and discoveries of the world right, and, right. Yeah. We have all the wildlife. I mean, there's no reason we can't. We have can't. a lot. Unfortunately, what happens is mm-hmm. uh the market is such and uh, for good or for bad um the the largest animal that sells out of India mm-hmm. uh is the tiger. That sells like uh, you mean as as, as, as film. a film, okay. as a film as a story is is uh, is the tiger because for everything else I think there's competition sitting in Africa. Of course. And uh, it's dominated by some of the big uh, big you know heavyweights of the industry. So mm-hmm. if there's a there's a film on say leopards uh, coming out in a particular broadcast mm-hmm. network. Uh no but that network or for that matter in the industry not everybody will want to do another leopard film. So right right. You know if BBC is right now done a series called Prime Right. They've covered a film on uh, a sequence on the lion-tailed macaque mm-hmm. in in India right. in the Western Ghats. Yeah. Now, if I were to go and pitch a story on a lion-tailed macaque, a blue chip one hour film, nobody's really going to buy it, right? Yeah, yeah. For another 2 3 years. Yeah. Okay. So, uh so it basically kind of uh, uh works like that. Hmm. What was your question? I forgot. I don't know. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about monkeys as, as you were speaking. I, I was like, have I watched that movie? That there, there was this movie that they shot in Jaipur. Monkey thieves. That was monkey thieves. Ja- Jaipur, yeah. yes. All yes. how monkeys are sometimes yeah. complete yeah. idiots. It, it runs on National Geographic. Yeah, yeah. A lot of seasons for yeah. it. I haven't watched the one about macaques. Uh, primates it's it's it, it's oh, now it's part airing. of the primate series no the uh, primates is this big uh, budget uh, you know blue chip they've done on right. primates around the world right. like how bbc has done um, dynasty and yeah, you yeah. know those kind of series so primates is one only on primates around the world and wow. so the lion tail macaque was one of the primates that was filmed oh okay okay yes cool so uh, how is that market if it's dominated by like the big ones oh yes So how is the market in India like? Uh so India you know I started off about 20 years ago mm-hmm. and at that time I can tell you uh I think I was really the only girl I was just 21 years old and mm-hmm. there was no one to help me guide me mm-hmm. um and I realized that what foreign productions look for you yeah. know uh when they come to India is a good cinematographer Hmm. and a sound recordist. Right. And I really didn't want to do camera though I hmm. know how to do camera I didn't want to. Sure. And I figured my niche lies in being a line producer for foreign productions. Hmm. And that is where I made my mark. Mm-hmm. You know, I could get you access, I could get you permissions, sure. I could organize all your shoots for you. Hmm. I still do that mm-hmm. and without pay- paying even one pesa as bribe <laughs> oh, that is impressive. where i kind mm-hmm. of take pride in mm-hmm. you know and i i i kind of got into that and i made my niche for myself and i kind of grew from there and mm-hmm. uh went on to kind of do a lot of other roles okay the more experience i got and the more confident i got i knew mm-hmm. i could make my own films mm-hmm. so yeah so i mean having said that uh so when 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 you know 
for everything else, like I said, there's competition sitting in right. Africa, you know, what eventually sells is a tiger films. Right. But right now what's happening is there is a huge shift in the industry, mm-hmm. uh, I think influenced by uh, a lot of the contemporary uh, problems that we're facing the mm-hmm. climate crisis right, pollution right. you know there's so much happening there's there's so to say a mass extinction happening yeah, yeah. right now the focus has shifted towards storytelling and films on lesser known species lesser mm. known habitats you know there's a lot that lives in the shadow of the tiger right. in our country oh um, and like the uh, whole ecosystem yeah that there is tiger there, there is, are, like, there are there's too much, you know, and obviously the tiger becomes your your umbrella, uh, you know, species. Post about, but, yeah. yeah, there's a lot. And I'm glad that globally, even broadcasters and, you know, con- mm-hmm. content uh, creators are realizing that these stories are very important to tell, mm. you know, mm. as, as if it's just documentation mm. or, you know, even creating empathy mm. and just awareness that this exists. Right. That's very important. Yeah. And I think... Uh, why I like watching wildlife films is that it sort of puts you in your place. It tells you that, hey, you know, you, you're also part of this. You might be living in a house and not in a forest, but this is where you came from. And, you know, one day, obviously, the saying is that you'll be like, mitti do hoi jaoge. <laughs> but then it's all connected, right? If one species dies, like we've read uh, this, uh, we've read a lot in evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology also, and in general anthropology that humans have been responsible for extinctions over like thousands of years especially our species like when we whenever we take up a, whenever we reach a new place all the top species die. like when indians not indians humans landed in australia all the big animals were dead like within like 500 years because we are so dominating so wildlife films play that role and tell you that there needs to be a a uh, strong preservation side that needs to that humans need to champion because no other species will do it and even if we don't do it, it we are at loss. I mean, tigers will go extinct, but eventually we will too. Yeah, yeah. It's all interconnected. That yeah. is, that's that's the ecological web. Right. You know, right. you have too many tigers, it's a problem. You have mm-hmm. too many deer, it's a problem. Mm-hmm. You have too many insects, is a problem. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the food web, the natural cycle, you know, mm-hmm. another species, a bigger species, is created. Right. Because and so that there can be a balance in the food web. Mm. And eventually everything boils down to that. Yeah. You know, if there is a balance. Right. Everything is in balance. Yeah. You can champion a cause and, you know, say that this needs protection, this needs protection. Mm. But there also is this parallel thought to which I kind of subscribe to to some Mm -hmm. extent is that sometimes you just have to let things be. Oh. And nature will take its own course and, you know, bounce back. Uh, when you say let things be, you mean like uh, whatever's going on should go on? No, 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 no. Uh, when I say <laughs> let things be is I mean to say don't interfere too much with oh. the natural cycle. Of things. Right, right. You know, obviously, okay, for example, there's a forest and it's being cut very heavily. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, you have to stop that. As a, as, as a person, as a human being, I will be the one who will say, yeah. I will go, you know, yeah. fight for uh, all of that to uh, kind of uh, not happen, the, 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 the cutting of trees not to happen. Yeah. But then, do I have the knowledge? If I let them be, those trees will come back. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, there's so much of uprooting that happens that mm-hmm. you have lost those trees. Now yeah. you got to plant it back. Yeah. Right. Either you let it be, it'll regenerate, it'll mm-hmm. take a lot of time, mm-hmm. or you kind of help it and regenerate it yeah. but then you should have the knowledge of what grows there yeah. you cannot uproot an entire forest and put palm trees there obviously that is not it's a stupid uh, thing it's stupidity yeah. that Unless is why you know indigenous animate. native species is yeah. is very important to grow in a particular habitat it's very important mm. to you I, I say it like you know no matter where you live whether it's a city or a you know countryside you should know what is native to your place yeah and that will grow best don't yeah. start bringing in things from outside and planting them mm-hmm. you may be creating a forest but is it going to be a balanced right. forest is it mm-hmm. something that is going to support life or become an invasion in mm-hmm. the larger scheme of things right i think uh that is there are multiple ways one can reach that you know that conclusion or that that type of thinking like for me it makes sense to uh grow local or like you know preserve local because that's how nature intended like that's how uh with the right temperature and the right geography topography everything that is how it has come to be 
so if you interfere there will be consequence yeah. right so for you uh, did this uh, this process of thinking did this come out after you were like exposed to the wild while filming or have you ever always been interested in it i was always interested in wildlife filmmaking it's just that i didn't know how to go about it mm-hmm. growing up i've done everything that i wanted to do or my parents asked me to do in terms mm-hmm. of you know having a career and all of that i was very lucky that very early on in life i got a break but while growing up you know when i was in my teens i was a very aggressive child mm-hmm. i was a very aggressive with person. anger issues sorry with anger issues you mean anger issues okay. you know how typically teenagers can be right and uh, i mean I, that was back yeah. in the 90s things were so different versus right, right. you know the kind of exposure levels and kind of understanding yeah. we had then and we have now but uh, um I, w- i was 21 when i got a break and i uh, started uh, you know natural history film making got into it and uh, being in the wild changed me a lot hmm. it calmed me down hmm. it taught me how to be patient hmm. i wasn't any of those things i was hmm. not calm i was not patient you know but it did hmm. you have to wait for hours for an animal to turn up at a particular spot you know this particular water hole is frequented by this particular elephant it comes here roughly between 3 o'clock 4 o'clock every mm-hmm. day you have to wait there there will be days it will not turn up mm-hmm. and those are the days you've chosen to film and it's yeah. not come up you have to be patient you can go look for it but mm-hmm. you want a shot of the water uh, the elephant drinking water at that particular water hole you know mm-hmm. so you have to just sit and wait there's nothing you can do there's nothing in your control you can't find it drag it and say come yeah, yeah. you know the elephants are like so independent like oh, yeah. you I can't mean, tame them you can't be like hey drink the water now <laughs> that's so, what i like about them yeah that's how wildlife filmmaking really changed me it grounded me and there's so much that i learned mm-hmm. silence mm-hmm. is oh, what really yeah. became my my best friend yeah. and it's silence that made me a think more clearly mm-hmm. and also understand the language of nature. Hmm. If you're filming with people 20 people in your crew there's bound to be a lot of chitter chatter going on nobody yeah. can keep quiet. Yeah. While life crews are very very small you're two three people mm-hmm. at the most mm-hmm. you know and you got have to be quiet and wait patiently. Yeah. You can't make noise you can't listen yeah. to music you can't yeah. do anything. You know to the extent that when if you if you're doing hardcore filming and you're in the wild for very long you can't even take a bath with soap. because it leaves a smell on you and oh. that smell is not great it's an artificial smell yes. it will either attract or repel the animal right most usually it repels animals they don't want to come there where there are artificial not smells soap, yeah. Yeah. yeah so you know mm. there's there lots to it yeah. if you get down to it yeah. but so how do you like uh, how do you shower then just like without soap water, water. you are in the wild what have you done yeah you know pasina aayega wo ja ke bas pani se nikal lo yeah, yeah. you know kapde dhone pani mein dalo thodi der soak karo yeah. nichodo aur nice and mujhe karna no you from your smell anyway so yes yes why give them an extra yeah. fragrance yeah because they they won't come it's, yeah. it's they will they will sense it as a threat mm-hmm. and they will just not come Hmm. So that doesn't add to your yeah. cause, <laughs> because yeah. it's an unnatural smell to them. Yeah. So they don't know what to yeah. do with it. Perfumes you shouldn't use. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I mean, sabun laga pe liya to perfume mat lagao. Sabun laga pe liya to it's like use a basic sabun, <laughs> but like don't use a strong one. Yeah. Hmm. So so you know it it taught you taught me a lot, and I was able to communicate with nature, understand what it's trying to say, understand how animals behave, hmm. and then be able to know exactly you know. when do i want to film mm-hmm. i can have a tigress is walking patrolling her territory and i can right. follow her for hours and hours and film aimlessly mm-hmm. but do i really need that footage mm-hmm. being a producer now when i look back i i am when i look at look at footage i can tell you that you know that sometimes you have so much of footage when you're in the field you get so excited in your film you don't realize baad mein someone has to sit and log it yeah. edit it hona hai someone has to scan through the whole footage yeah. four hour ki footage mein you need that one precise shot where she has actually sent marked a particular tree You know, four hours. Mm. May someone is going to sit there and go mad. Storage becomes a nightmare. Obviously. Who thinks of all those things? Yeah, yeah. Nobody does. But now, with experience, I can tell you, roll, mm. don't roll. <laughs> okay. So, um, but isn't like the footage recycled or like used? I mean, some some of the footage will be very boring. The tiger is sleeping, then it's sleeping. You can't do much about it. <laughs> yeah, you can recycle footage a lot, but it mm. also depends if you have footage rights. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, see, yeah. when films are commissioned by a particular network, when they're commissioned, mm-hmm. the network takes all the rights to the footage and everything. Of course. You know, so you don't own yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. But footage that you own, yes, you can do so much with mm. it. You can make short forms. Mm-hmm. You know, you can create small small stories, and yeah. you know, I mean, are, are Indian networks interested? 
in wildlife films unfortunately no really yeah they're not uh, ours is a very fiction dominated uh, industry and thanks to the advent of ott platforms yeah. it's just skewed the balance completely um, nobody wants to watch non fiction and as a result of which networks don't want to commission non fiction like mm-hmm. i'm talking about ott platforms right, right. okay you still have a uh, sony bbc earth the national geographic or discovery right in india but they don't commission wildlife out of india mm-hmm. when i say don't commission the big blue chip hardcore lovely stuff that's filmed over years and mm-hmm. you know uh, that kind of they don't have the kind of money they end mm. up commissioning a lot of uh, lifestyle oriented travel of you know uh, food shows religious yeah. things and all of that uh, so um so obviously you know i mean it's not easy making a wildlife film mm-hmm. it's not a quick turnaround thing mm-hmm. unless of course you're doing i'm doing a series called on the brink mm-hmm. it's about endangered species and wildlife in india it's mm-hmm. uh, funded by uh, hcl Oh, okay and uh, um um so we put this together and then we have taken it to the network to put it on air mm-hmm. okay the network didn't commission it they didn't have the budgets for it oh this is discovery and animal planet and even know, they didn't have the budgets they didn't have the budgets okay so they don't have the money mm-hmm. if i were to take this to uh, to a foreign uh, to uh, i would invariably have to pitch this abroad right and when i started this when we started this two years back you know nobody was looking at conservation Mm-hmm. then nobody wants to show conservation it's very boring right so the onus was me on me to make the series very interesting mm-hmm. talk about conservation but not harp on it and make it like good stories that people would like to watch so how are you doing it it was fine i mean in the first season we had an anchor mm-hmm. uh it worked very well uh now we've done season 2 and we evolved a bit and we said this season we'll take away the anchor mm-hmm. and we will make the local conservationist scientists biologists who are working on that particular right. animal the anchors of that particular episode mm-hmm. whether they're good on camera not good mm-hmm. on camera it's all right yeah. it's their story yeah yeah so that's how we evolved it's, it's doing well it's the second season is going to probably uh, come next year early next year mm-hmm. on national geographic in india Oh cool. And how was the response to the first season? It was good going by what uh, uh, the first season aired on Discovery and Animal Planet. Okay. It wasn't commissioned so we put it there and mm-hmm. now this time around second season uh, has been bought by uh, National Geographic. Mm-hmm. It's been good going by whatever the you know the TRP ratings that the network mm-hmm. uh, gave us. Yeah. I think I think in two cities we 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 were beaten by uh, Sony BBC Earth. But that's not really a competition because that's not the kind of show we made that's oh. completely blue chip and oh yeah the yeah, earth yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 that is like see that again if you look at that network um everything that you see on that network is not commissioned in, in india it's the bbc one yeah, yeah it's yeah, bbc obviously. productions done globally that yeah. come onto that network to be aired in india right you know mm-hmm. so again they're not buying anything they're commissioning anything locally mm. They're, they're not commissioning it, yeah. natural history Out of stuff. The UK. Um what yeah. it platforms are very clear they don't want to commission uh, natural history stuff unless of course it's it's some But uh, I'm uh, surprised that OTD platforms don't want to because there's a there's clearly a market and in this project. Yes, there's clearly a but, market but what has happened is that non-fiction is not uh, something a lot of people are watching. That's the really? current trend. Hmm. They're watching a lot of your Netflix originals in terms of you know yeah, all the fiction. all the fiction that uh, that comes mm. uh, the 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 non fiction that they do commission the some of the stuff that you see that has been commissioned has been by extremely big studios globally mm. with very very big names mm-hmm. you know I would I don't think so Netflix India would give me that kind of money to do it mm-hmm. they wouldn't they'd probably yeah. give it to a BBC or someone that partner sure, sure. and you know um, do that. But mm. having said that, I mean, they should realize that. I mean, I, I always say network should realize that people are not watching, but start building and putting it out there, and they will start watching. Yeah. So I think it works both ways. But they understand the economics much better than I do. So, Probably, uh, you know. That's the thing. Like uh, before cable came to India, we were not watching any wildlife films because yeah. they did not exist. Yeah. But once uh, they launched, first it was in English because they thought, oh, only the urban yeah. people will watch it. but then they started translating it yes. like they had subtitles then eventually they you know dubbed all the episodes in regional languages because there was a market 
so there's clearly a market but yeah there is probably. yeah you just have to i think invest realize and invest in it yeah you don't have to make big budget stuff and exactly. put it out there start with some small little stuff and you mm. know create a little database and yeah. put it out there i'm sure there will be people if there was i mean i've made my kids watch uh, you know the uh, my octopus teacher on netflix mm-hmm. and um uh, what app uh, one world seven continents what is that mm-hmm. planet no, I'm not sure. uh, there's so much i mean there are a couple of big yeah. big blue planet b- not blue planet the recent one on netflix i forgot the name mm-hmm. it was it's a, again i think a bbc thing mm-hmm. um, so that's interesting because your kids are getting like hands on exposure of all my kids films, travel so, yeah. everywhere really? with us to the forest to the forest they uh they're very different kids i would say mm. uh, smarter I, yes Of course, you're a mother. You say <laughs> yes. Uh, smarter, also they think differently, also because I think we've been able to, we've been the lucky ones to be able to expose them to that right balance of right. city and the wild. Hmm. And because we get uninhibited access in the wild, they go with us. Hmm. They see animals and what we do very up close. There's no school there, but of them course. just running around and exploring the space, forest. Nature to them just changes the way yeah. they are. Yeah, you know, there's this German. We're very lucky, I would say. Mm. You know, ours is the that one job where we can take our kids to work. <laughs> yeah, every day. <laughs> every There are day. no special They bring your kids to work days. They can do school for months, and you yeah. know. Yeah. You know, there's this German concept of forest kindergartens. Yeah. Where they bring the kids to like a local natural park or a natural forest around the cities, and they have their UKGs and KGs there, and they found that kids not only grow like smarter, they also are more empathetic. and more sensitive to nature and they have a, a higher conservatory attitude than normal people yes so i think yeah um there's a school in delhi mm-hmm. forgetting the name the orobindo ashram school um mm-hmm. it's it's a very different concept okay there are classrooms but classes are held out in the open oh under a tree a parent can come and take a class it's like homeschooling mm mm-hmm. in a school yeah 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 you know there are no unif- there's no concept of uniforms sure. and all of that and i mean a classroom is like the child feels comfortable to sit on a tree and mm-hmm. you know uh, take the class fine or sit on the ground and take the class yeah. it's fine yeah. um it's a very different concept and uh, i i know a couple of children who have come out of that school and i can tell you they're very very different mm-hmm. their approach to life is very mo- very realistic very practical mm-hmm. they're more empathetic they're more understanding they're mm-hmm. very clear mm mm-hmm. and i think if you can expose your child to things like that from a very early stage mm-hmm. there's nothing like it yeah there's really nothing like it i yeah. mean get the opportunity holidays I mean, what better a holiday than yeah. going in a forest right yeah. i mean you can always stay for kids it's a holiday for us it's work work, work. <laughs> exactly so uh like do you see that there is a marked difference when they are out in the open compared to when they are in the classroom Right now there is no classroom, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yes, I do. My kids are very small. My son is now five, and my daughter's eight. But both of them have been traveling with us from mm. the time they were born. You know, mm. my daughter was thirty days old when he took her off <laughs> okay. into the wild, and so with my son also, a little later though, three months later. But yeah, mm. we did. Um, it's a way of life for them. Mm. You know, it's it's really a way of life. It's I, if if I look at. Uh, what they have come back with they've come back with a lot more memories mm-hmm. a lot more happiness mm-hmm. a lot more fresh air which mm-hmm. is very rare in delhi right, here right. you know uh, they're healthier they mm. think much better um they think, think much better as in as in in the sense uh there's is again like i would say a more practical approach to the way that they see things mm-hmm. i think it's also a little true with how we as parents are mm-hmm. um you know um they they they're very practical in whatever they do my son if you see right now he doesn't want to go to school even online school he's much more interested in picking up you know skills to do like carpentry and painting and this and that and he's mm-hmm. very clear This is what I want to do. I don't want to sit in front of a computer because that's the the like he says, you know, the ch and the st and the gr are getting me nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's like a more hands-on person. Yeah, both mm. of them. Both okay. Of them. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. I think they get a break from that mundane, you know, routine. It's a mundane routine. I mean, they realize city it. life is mundane. Yeah. Like we've yeah. grown up with this idea that you know cities are the ultimate. 
you know expression of human advancement but actually it's just a lot of concrete it is and the last 9 months of of this lockdown the pandemic mm-hmm. you know they've been the toughest for us because yeah. it's the first time we have been at home for so long mm-hmm. we have never been home for this yeah. long at a stretch we're always yeah. traveling to some place or the other to some forest or the other mm-hmm. it's been very difficult and it's just difficult living in the city we don't realize there's a lot of noise all the time all the time yeah. even at night yeah when is the last time you heard a cricket or an insect outside your oh, window yeah. at night yeah 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 i know what you're saying i mean when i grew up i grew up in very small town like in the middle of villages practically so we used to have a lot of exposure to you know a lot of snakes too which was a bit scary but a lot of natural sounds and then whenever you go back to that environment it sort of brings a it i want to don't want to say it's peaceful because it's very cliche to say it but it does like your uh, face gets relaxed your shoulders are like your body feels that you're not there's no tension in your body like you just yeah. let it be my you husband when i see him in the forest hmm. in 24 hours he yeah. sheds like 10 years he looks like a completely that's different exactly man. what i'm saying so this face right now if i take this and shoot this podcast in a forest <laughs> i'll be a, i think like next if we ever do again. it together we should go we somewhere should do it, it in a forest yes i we'll will take you around we'll do a walking podcast oh yeah we could do that you know hm i mean we should the entire setup is run on batteries anyway yeah, so anyways, we can take you know, it. we just carry these these, mics, they, these com- they come off yeah, so we yeah. can do that these cameras come off yeah. sandy is all, already coming off <laughs> he he's a filmmaker also so okay. he loves traveling yeah so we should totally do yeah, it yeah we should we should yeah you know i mean if you look at it when when you when you get online and you listen to all these meditation sounds and relaxing yeah. sounds to calm you and make <laughs> you sleep what is it yeah yeah it I've, sounds I've never of nature yeah 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 played through you via yeah. some technology yeah those yeah and you know where the very few countries still have all this available very close to where we are yeah. whether it's a city i mean look at yeah. delhi there's the aravalli forest yes you know which is in a bad state but mm. it is a forest it is a forest yeah. it's there it's up yeah. to us to kind of you know yeah. we still have a lot of forest left like uh, despite all the degradation all the catastrophic status that we are in in the middle of right now we still have a lot of forest and if you go to like central indian states like mp for example i love traveling to that state because it's naturally so beautiful, beautiful. it's got like small hills plateaus and you know everything. forests it's and everything it's quite a mix yeah. yeah yeah so i like traveling to that like especially to the eastern uh, to the eastern side towards chatisgarh there's kana national park and yes, all those places yes. so the whole state i mean we have a lot of unexplored areas in general in india look at the northeast oh yeah obviously seriously yeah. it is beautiful it's yeah. a mess i would say right now because mm-hmm. in the last two years i can tell you i went there when i was doing on the brink season 1 i mean i've been going there for a long time but mm-hmm. on the brink season 1 was the first time in the last 18 years i would say i saw winters in the northeast was as polluted as what it was in delhi really yeah why because wherever we were we realized there's massive logging going on oh so the trees are coming trees off trees are being now. cut yeah. and now in winters i could see pollution was just hanging mm, that's really you sad. know these are traditional communities they yeah. still use firewood and all of that mm-hmm. to uh Uh, keep themselves warm yeah. and you know run their kitchens uh, because it's very remote i mean yeah. gas and electricity yeah, yeah. hasn't really reached every part over there yet mm-hmm. but there was a time when all of that didn't just hang it kind of lifted off but mm-hmm. now even in a day you know that smoke just hangs mm-hmm. the smoke Could just hangs could also be due to population because now most stoves are being lit right uh, yes but uh, i i i the places that i have gone to mm-hmm. i haven't seen that drastic a population increase, uh, increase. Mm. i have seen a drastic infrastructure change mm-hmm. roads have got better and you know houses have yeah. become concrete to so that adds to a lot of gone. pollution like building a road adds to i mean no matter how essential building a road is i mean it does add because you're wiping out basically soil yeah. and putting concrete over it yeah. and then the concrete flies off in the air the dust yeah. you know yeah. the silicon. and you have chopped off trees your barriers exactly. and your sinks right. of all of that pollution and carbon yeah. that you've kicked up you know you've yeah. chopped off the trees so the 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 naturally how much ever you know could have been absorbed yeah. it's going to take much more time now mm-hmm. and you know afforestation mm-hmm. is a joke ए फॉरेस्टेशन आपने सौ पेड़ इस 
इस दस किलोमीटर के लेंथ के लिए सौ पेड़ निकाल दिए तोड़ दिए यू नो कहीं कहीं प्लांट हुए और द गवर्नमेंट सेड यू टू प्लांट इन अदर लाइक टू हंड्रेड ट्रीज एल्सवेयर क्या ट्रीज प्लांट किए वो दे नीट ऑफ द टू हंड्रेड यू प्लांटेड हाउ मनी हैव सर्वाइव आपने कर तो दिए अरे देर आर ऑलवेज इज ड्राइव की टू करो ट्रीज प्लांटेड और वन लैक ट्रीज प्लांटेड वॉट्स द फॉलो अपॉलो विच ट्रीज गिनेस बुक ऑफ वर्ल्ड रिकॉर्ड इन डूइंग दैट बट वॉट इज द फॉलो अप हाउ मनी हैव सर्वाइव वॉट वो दो स्पीशीज दट यूव प्लांटेड आर दे रियली इम्पॉर्टेंट इन दैट लैंडस्केप Look at Delhi Airport, so pretty and all that. Right? Mm. Palm, palm, palm everywhere. I don't know where this idea of palm is coming from. I don't know. It's I so think irritating. it's this global thing about airport designs. Yeah, they're just palm trees. Palm trees, and they look ridiculous. You know, I mean, the more palm trees you have, I think you get the tender. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, <laughs> we're gonna use like X amount of concrete and steel and Y amount of palm trees, and that's how you get yeah, it. It's so artificial. It looks pretty, but it's so artificial. I mean, it doesn't even look pretty. It looks very curated. curated. It looks very artificial. The one thing I can't stand mm-hmm. is manicured lawns. Yeah, I mean the concept we of lawns is don't realize yeah. that we have ruined a complete ecology mm-hmm. that lives under leaf litter. Yeah. There are insects, yeah. birds feed on those yeah. insects. You know, there's a life that's a habitat that's that's a home for so many creatures, yeah. insects. Yeah. We're losing insects at a very rapid rate yeah. and we don't un- realize what's going to happen very yeah. soon. We don't realize how important they are because they're so yeah. tiny. I mean, it's I mean, human nature. I mean, there again I would say, you know, it's it's all about communication mm-hmm. how many films have been made that have been mm-hmm. inter- i'm sure there are lots of films and insects that have been made but how many films have been so interesting that you want to watch it and you want to make your family watch yeah yeah there was this one so eventually about film making boils down to storytelling and how interesting right. and different it can be which insect would you want to make a film on if you given a chance lots of them yeah like I mean, you have I don't to choose names one. of so many but uh, okay, sure. um cicada was a cicada you know when you go into the forest mm. you hear this humming sound which kind of rises and falls mm. uh it's an insect that lives in these tree barks mm. sometimes you're standing on a tree and you feel some water has fallen on you ek do yeah, yeah, yeah. these are cicada secretions spitting on you have. yeah or shitting on you <laughs> shitting spitting uh you know uh mm. it's 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 i think it's a very it's a nice uh, it's a audio issue uh, in the wild mm-hmm. when you're recording audio because you have to wait for the cicadas to shut up uh, uh and they normally don't they sort of start, start off in the middle of a sentence no matter how much perfume you wear you, they won't shut up no 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 <laughs> they won't okay. <laughs> But okay. lots of insects. Every insect, yeah, grasshoppers, and oh, there's so much. Mm. There's some beautiful. Uh, um, um, there's there's lovely films made on ants with macro lenses. Oh, ants are amazing because ants behave in a way that humans probably cannot. Yeah. Especially can will not. <laughs> I don't know if they can. Like I don't know if we're programmed to behave that in socially intelligently. So the community intelligence among ants is out of this world. I mean, the way they behave. in general like we see birds flying in a group and automatically adjusting to a shape when yes. they fly but the pure marvel of ants building colonies is i think ants are subconsciously trying to take over the world they just so tiny too tiny yeah if they were a tad bit bigger they would have built like their own pyramids by now I'm probably sure. pyramids were built by ants i'm sure they are they exist underground yeah Well, you know, on social parents. media, mm. I've seen these uh, videos where people have uh, poured molten um, uh, metal into an ant hole. Why? What ant hole? Basically, holes? see the structure underneath. So the the molten metal, oh. melted metal, goes everywhere where the chambers are, and then they've dug it up, removed the soil, and you have the structure, and you see how gigantic it is. You're talking about these pyramids. Yeah. Just so sh- on 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 Facebook, no, just do uh, molten metal ants. So, kuch na kuch aaj. <laughs> lots of videos okay. i mean it, it's obviously very cruel you've wiped out an entire yeah. colony but just see one we did to understand what's happening underground what are the wow. kind of chambers and the pathways and the networking and the yeah. little little chambers that they've created it's beautiful and we can replicate that design yeah yeah i'm Because sure if so the thing about animals or, or birds like if they're you know sticking to a design it means it's naturally very conducive to yeah. whatever they t- yeah. like bees do they build their you know what is the Hive. like, hives in hexagons right yeah. because it's very conducive to carrying weight and like coexisting with other chambers and similarly when ants build something i don't know exactly what shapes or patterns they follow but whatever they follow it's very conducive to like if tomorrow we want to set build you know a city 
for example we could follow that design yeah i mean i now that you say it mm-hmm. and i look i am looking i'm thinking of that visual of what what they pull out eventually it is it's like the roots of a tree yeah yeah basically so it's a foundation on top mm-hmm. of which if you were to construct you could mm-hmm. make anything stand yeah it's that widespread and so well networked like the roots of a tree exactly. to make that entire tree stand up straight yeah and we're still building like foundations of buildings with like square bricks and stuff yeah, like that yeah which fall down they will always fall <laughs> down <laughs> i mean we saw what happened in like kedarnath was it or like when the floods yeah, yeah, came yeah, yeah, yeah. everything just collapsed yeah, with the river yeah probably if they had like some trees holding them <laughs> that's why trees don't fall yeah because trees are very roots. important obviously for the oxygen and the carbon uh, you know uh, storage that they do roots bind mm. the soil together yeah and when you bind the soil together you know it doesn't allow erosion to wipe away the, take away the top soil top yeah. soil is very important it takes mm, you know how many yeah, yeah, centuries yeah. for top soil to get created Absolutely. one inch of it yeah, yeah. you know if you lose that you've lost it's not not coming back for yeah, like it's at not least coming so many back, years yeah. you know and that is why it's not just the top part of the tree the <laughs> inside also is very important exactly. it binds the soil together yeah that's why they say never forget the your roots yeah <laughs> Where you're coming from? That's what the strongest part of Everything the personality you, is. You know, if you see, it kind of there is. It's it's coming from nature. Yeah. Every lesson that you're supposed to learn or know your, yeah. you know, your morals. Everything has, I think, a root somewhere in nature. Yeah, yeah. Because as a species, we have lived so close to nature for so long. Yeah. Our morality, a lot of our morality derives yeah. from nature, right? Yeah. Our philosophy. You were telling me. a lot about diy <laughs> right so i was just wondering whether that ha- that is something you've also like learned from nature yes uh, i have when i started what are you doing like in diy specifically lots of things mm-hmm. uh, okay so when i started um uh, you know uh, traveling to these forests and meeting a lot of remote indigenous communities i don't know it was i think in my subconscious i was very fascinated by the way these people look in terms of how their skin is and how their hair is uh, which ones the ones who indigenous live in communities indigenous people communities. tribal communities sure. people who live you know in forests or close yeah. to forests and i would start chatting and start noting down what they do hmm. hair care skin care you know medicines i mean what do they do when they have a cold hmm. it's not that they go to a chemist and buy yeah. crocin or you know cold urine or something so little ghar ke nuske type of things and i started documenting all of that oh wow and when i used to come back home and obviously i used to also pick up a lot of those uh products uh, the ingredients they use okay. you know it could be spices or mm-hmm. you know things that they grow specifically for their mm-hmm. hair or their skin or stuff that they use just off their kitchen shelf and you know uh, how mm. to make uh, different oil concoctions for dandruff problem or hair fall problem oh, wow. and all of that so i started documenting all of this and i used to when i used to come back home i used to experiment on myself and on my parents after i got <laughs> married i experimented on my husband and now i experiment on my children and at one point um I started putting all of this together and I formed this little outlet where I sold stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have acne, I had a product for you, you know, concoction oh, really? made at home in my kitchen and okay. all of that. So under your brand. Oh, yeah, it was called uh, it I have a company called the Gaia people. So oh. it initially started under that and mm-hmm. then a, a very close friend of mine got very interested and we formed a proper company. Mm-hmm. We went online, we mm-hmm. sold on a number of websites for mm-hmm. a couple of years. We did very well. It mm-hmm. was called Artisanal Skin Care. Uh so um it was stuff that i made at home mm. and order came i would make it fresh mm-hmm. no preservatives no chemicals mm. at all and package it really nicely mm-hmm. and we would courier it then when my shoots would happen orders would come in there was no one to manufacture okay <laughs> that became a problem yeah, you know because was, still then you were doing it yourself yeah, i i mean yeah, i was always do it myself right. we looked for th- contract manufacturing and third party mm-hmm. manufacturing but that would mean that um you have to increase the shelf life of your product you have yeah. to mass uh, produce right. you have to start putting uh, preservatives right. you know you, uh, and we weren't very comfortable going the, into that uh, space mm. plus what we did was in food grade category of uh, skin care and wellness it's very difficult to get licenses for that in india oh, okay. you know um and it just kind of fell out and we had to shut shop because well two years ago i was out for 8 months last year i was out for about 9 months mm-hmm. you know at a stretch and orders piled up and mm-hmm. yeah, so yeah, we had yeah. to shut shop yeah i still do it i still have a few people who reach <laughs> out to me and yeah. you know uh yeah i do that I, i'm hugely interested and 
the the years that this company uh, ran not one person had a negative uh, reaction side okay. or side effect mm-hmm. and so is still running the brand no the brand i mean it exists but the company is shut somebody has to uh, order something yeah you just uh, tell me i'll make it for you and i'll give it to you most of a podcast yeah. is if wondering about his skin care how do that that person i i have an instagram account uh, called by akanksha soot your hyper local wellness grandma okay. i just started that very recently mm-hmm. uh, so i put in these little diy things on cleaning your house right. you know stuff that you can make right. whether it's a room freshener mm-hmm. or a problem of hair fall mm-hmm. or you know black underarms mm-hmm. or uh, so you know so you've documented all of that from How? My travels. Wow. Uh, I have like this massive. Book. So you I would have spoken to a lot of people yes. about what they're doing. Yes. You know the one biggest mistake when I look back now, I did not document the people. I was so busy writing yeah. the recipes. You were like, "How can I make my skin glow?" Forget these people. <laughs> I was I so stay busy here. writing recipes, you know. But I remember them. They all are in my head, and I know I'll never forget sure, them. Sure. But. but you know it's 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 been amazing the stuff that i have learned just talking to people and using the stuff that they use in my own house i've i've grown so much of stuff mm-hmm. in my own house i've brought this there's something called wild turmeric kasturi manjal which grows in the western ghats in these tropical areas i have no areas. idea what that is but Kerala, the it's a, name it's a kind of tells me turmeric. it's going to do wonders to my skin it has this beautiful smell mm-hmm. it's largely used in cosmetics okay it grows in the western ghats mm-hmm. I got roots of the turmeric, and I'm growing them here in Noida. Okay. <laughs> in this climate. We're gonna visit your house after you must, all, you all must. the information you're in giving fact, us. In fact, when the lockdown started, before the lockdown mm-hmm. started, mm-hmm. should we cut because the light went off? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> hmm. Okay. That's fine, yeah. Before the lockdown started, a month before that, mm-hmm. you know, when there was nothing of this pandemic happening, I started rooftop gardening. Mm-hmm. and it's i'm telling you it's one of the things that get me sane through this lockdown rooftop gardening as in like i have a roof mm-hmm. i start growing vegetables there okay. in pots and little diy carries mm-hmm. and all of that and i'm growing everything <laughs> everything <laughs> Cool. And I think I, all like, of this uh, that I do these interests and passions that I've created on the side are a natural fallout of this large passion of doing wildlife films mm-hmm. it's all coming from there okay you know I mean tomorrow if you were to tell me let's start a business mm-hmm. this is where I'll come and say okay you know something related to gardening something related to my DIY skin care mm-hmm. wellness or mm-hmm. something like that is where I will probably tell you this is why this is my comfort zone uh-huh. it'll be an extension of all of this it's all of it is an extension of my you know 20 years of being in the wild mm, that's interesting so we are, what we are going to do now is you're going to give me an orange So basically Christmas is around the corner and mm. this is one season which has mm. become so huge in India one yeah. festival that's become so huge in India mm. and I think in India it's one of the most uh, pollution generating festivals because mm. of all the paraphernalia we yeah. bring in from the market yeah. in terms of the plastic and uh, right. uh, you know stuff that's going to be recycled just to decorate this massive tree mm-hmm. and put in these kind of uh, these these glittery glittery stuff mm-hmm. on it yeah uh So there's a lot to Christmas that can be done which mm. is very eco-friendly mm-hmm. very good for your health right. and for the house and all right. of that one would be you know want a nice smell in your house right of course okay what you do is take some you know uh you know garam masala mein jo bhi saman jata hai na yeah. usko pani mein boil kar do okay and let that water in a kettle keep boiling and the vapors just rafting through your house mm-hmm. gives a very nice smell oh. you can just do it with cinnamon or some flowers or essential oil you put it in an oil diffuser and mm-hmm. let the smell just kind of you know mm-hmm. circulate around circulate around your house it'll linger yeah. for a very long yeah. time your curtains will absorb it sofa will absorb it carpet <laughs> will absorb it yeah. along with all the pollution <laughs> mm-hmm. christmas trees right don't buy christmas trees Why? It's, they're all artificial. They're anyway. artificial. Yeah. The ones that you get in the market in these nurseries won't last. Mm. Will last probably till March, and then they will die out. Yeah. And which tree anyway grows in a perfect shape? No, it doesn't. I mean, you know, at my house, what we do is we stack books. Uh, and we make this little pyramid of a, uh, of a Christmas mm. tree decorations. Yeah. So this is doing, an orange. Yeah. Okay. What okay. are we doing with the orange? Ah, uh, mm. you have to do this a few days before. I have very bad nails. I chew my nails. If you're going to take a close up, I think uh, I, I, I don't have good ones. Do 
You do. Gemeine was. Okay. So this oops is an orange. Yes. Oops, it's fallen down. Try a... to kind of peel it in a way that you know as much comes Skin. out in one go. Yeah. This is a cutter, a cookie cutter. You right. get it in a lot of shapes. You get hearts and you get stars sure, and you sure. get animals. Mm-hmm. You take a cookie cutter, press it and cut out like two three of these. It's going to come out in good shapes. Yeah, you you need like a, you know you need those uh, chopping boards below. Mm. I think I'm doing fine. You're doing fine? Yeah. 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 Now you have this. Mm. A little thing. Yeah. <laughs> you can use that too you yeah. have this little thing uh, so imagine it was a star or something mm-hmm. okay and you have lots of them yeah okay my sister has actually been saving some of these i don't know for what great for mm-hmm. the skin sure mm-hmm. orange peel powder mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> so uh you 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 uh, it's wet right now mm-hmm. okay press it in a book mm-hmm. or keep it flat pressed in the sun mm-hmm. for two days mm-hmm. it'll dry out and harden Oh okay. Okay. And then you take a sui dhaga and string them. Mm. And you can make wonderful hanging decorations for your house mm-hmm. which will also smell very nice. Ah. And it's recyclable after you finish with Christmas you can throw it in a pot and it'll compost. Mhm. Including and then it's going to give me the fragrance. It'll it will. You don't dehydrate it for a month because then there'll right. be no fragrance. It'll sure. be completely dehydrated. And how long will it last? Oh, uh, it's it'll it'll keep drying. So you mm. hang it and it'll just naturally dry. You you basically dry it out for 2 days mm-hmm. so that it becomes hard mm-hmm. and it retains its shape. Mhm. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> go, go, go 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 no I don't have you have. So you can do that with you know a cutter and just orange peels. Mm. I'm going to try that. Do it. On that note, I'm going to thank you for coming to the podcast. Thank you so much Akanksha. Thank you so much for having me here. It was really lovely. Yes, and I got an orange to it.